hello and welcome to Living Pluralism, a presentation of the Reformed Institute of Metropolitan DC. I'm David Gray, pastor here at Bradley Hills Presbyterian Church in Bethesda, Maryland, where I've served since 2009. And I'm pleased to share my experience in helping to create a three faith house of worship and being in dialogue, relationship, mission, education, worship, and strategic planning with diverse communities of interfaith pluralistic witness. Many reformed congregations are or are considering engaging with an increasingly diverse society and living out pluralism by being in relationship with non-reformed Christians in ways different from previous generations. Many of us experience interfaith couples coming for counseling Congregations looking to maintain expensive historic buildings are partnering with non-reformed religious communities in building sharing arrangements. PCUSA churches are increasingly engaging in pulpit swaps and joint education programs with clergy from other faith traditions. And communities are pooling resources for joint mission projects. And so in the time that we are together, I'd like to address the pastoral and personal, prophetic and practical considerations of living out pluralism for reformed Christians and communities in 2021 and beyond. What do we do with the increasing religious diversity and pluralism of our nation and world as reformed Christians? Do we think that it's okay and, and actually a good thing? How might we embrace it? How might we live into the pluralism and religious diversity in a way consistent with reformed values? I know that this is part of a series in which others may share more thoughts about reformed theology. I will cover that some, but will also seek to get into more of the practical issues of living out pluralism as I have experienced them. Now, there are at least four kinds of areas of pluralistic partnership that I have seen where one might explore dialogue and partnership. There are ecumenical relationships of reformed Christians being in community with other Christians, like Lutherans and Catholics, for example. There is inter intrafaith work, intrafaith work, where more progressive PCUSA congregations, for example, might be in partnership with more conservative ECHO or EPC Presbyterian congregations. There are ethnic lines where majority Caucasian reformed churches might be in partnership with majority Asian congregations, for example, or with African American congregations, such as the Interwoven Congregation project in our Greater Presbytery seeks to bring forward. And then there are interfaith relationships between Reformed Christians or Buddhists, for example, or others in the Abrahamic tradition. I think the lessons of one apply to the others, but I will explore today mostly the fourth area and my experience with Abrahamic congregations. And so welcome to Living Pluralism. There are many reasons in which this area, I believe, is consistent with reformed values. Protestants have tended over the years to affirm religious toleration, even though Luther and Calvin and other reformers had mixed and at times negative views towards people of other religious backgrounds. The focus on the gospel and its centrality caused them to be skeptical and not accept others outside of their own tradition at times. But for us today, I believe we can both have a gospel as reformed Christians with Christ at the center and engage in effective ministry in our diverse world by embracing the pluralistic experiences of understanding the sacred in new ways. The word religion at its heart means to connect. And for reformed traditions, connecting with those in a pluralistic world is consistent with our values. As one connects in a pluralistic world, one is forced to articulate out loud this heart of one's faith. 
I found that understanding the sacred in other traditions strengthens my own walk with God. And as we talk about the importance theologically of humility and of doubt and of living into the questions, embracing and living pluralism is consistent with such values. Scripturally, we knew how Paul was interested in spreading the gospel to broader groups outside of Jerusalem, to Jews and to Gentiles. How Luke in Acts in the Pentecost story talks about the great diversity of language. And Jesus in the Great Commission in thinking about making disciples of all nations and the focus more broadly on ethnos and the diversity experienced then. That Jesus emerging from the Jewish world and how understanding faith traditions beyond Christianity helps us understand the Old Testament and Jesus more. How Christ calls us as Reformed Christians to understand and love our neighbors and to be healers. Living pluralism can help us heal in a broken world. And certainly at a time of rapid secularization, where just earlier this spring, a Gallup poll stated that for the first time, those who consider themselves members of a church, synagogue, or mosque has dropped below 50% in America for the first time, compared to 1937, for example, when 73% claimed church membership. This shift in the US population away from religious institutions is something that has profound implications for reformed Christians. And so our understanding the diversity of the sacred becomes important. If we wanna have a social fabric in America and the world which connects and is strong at difficult times, we must understand that in our broken world that we read about from Genesis three on is still a world where we affirm with the author of Psalm 139 that God is the God of all parts of creation. And so is reformed Christians who seek not to be stationary, but to be on the move, always reformed and being reformed. We have an opportunity to see how living pluralism is consistent with our values. With confessions in our faith, such as the Confession of 1967, which works towards reconciliation, living pluralism can help us be reconciled to others. As we seek to live in the ideas of the great ends of the church, statements crafted in the past century to guide the vision and mission of the Presbyterian Church. We note that as the Book of Order reminds us, the promotion of social righteousness is key. And so let us explore what it means to be living pluralism. I have found that the heart of this ministry is one of relationships. Here's a picture of myself and Rabbi Sonny from Bethesda Jewish Congregation with whom we share sacred space here at 6601 Bradley Boulevard, sitting in our Covenant Hall, a joint project of the two congregations to build sacred space together. Over Sonny's left shoulder there, is what is known as the Psalm 23 or Moses window, depending on one's tradition. It is an interfaith symbol in an interfaith room. And interestingly, one that Nintendo, which Nintendo, Nintendo, the video game maker calls the Moses window, gives a huge amount of Pokemon points. And so we have all sorts of young adults and teenagers wandering around our campus trying to get inside this room to get near that window when they're playing Pokemon because of its value in the game. There are four ways in which living pluralism has been meaningful to me. Pastorally, as it broadens one's pastoral sensibilities. Personally, as it's a rewarding ministry. Prophetically, as it helps address some of the key issues of society, and practically, as it allows one to deal with key issues of sustainability. Pluralism has great promise, but also pitfalls, as we'll discuss. It's a theological conversation and discussion, but also nuts and bolts. And at the end of the day, as our picture indicates here, for one of our interfaith worship services, it is about friendships, understanding, and relationships. It's reformed, great mission, wonderful, great evangelism, great pastorally, helps financially, 
feels sacred, but is not without risks. I'm gonna go back and talk for a moment, if I could, about my own experience, my own journey as someone who's long had an interest in interfaith work. For 54 years, Bradley Hills Presbyterian Church has shared sacred space with Bethesda Jewish congregation. 54 years in which these two congregations have lived under the same roof. In 1967, Bethesda Jewish congregation, BJC, began to rent space for the high holidays here at 6601 from Bradley Hills Presbyterian Church. Then they began to add a rental for bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs and other sacred experiences in the building. It was helpful for them not to have to have the expense of maintaining their own building. BJC soon after began worshiping for its Shabbat service each Friday, and then years later began adding Shabbat services on Saturday. Over time, they began to add offices within the building. And then in 1999, the two congregations joined together in a joint project of fundraising in order to build additional space. That covenant hall space that I mentioned er earlier, the word covenant, meaning the partnership between the two congregations and the covenant God has with us. It was extremely rare to have two congregations sharing sacred space like this for 54 years now, but perhaps even rare for them to jointly take on debt together in a joint financial relationship of borrowing money, raising money, but also borrowing money to build new office space and to build a dedicated space where BJC could have its Shabbat services, where Bradley Hills could have its early service on Sundays, but also a number of joint programs together. The communities signed covenants, similar to Jewish ketubas. Here's one right here in front of us on the screen where we have together covenanted to be in partnership, in relationship together. As we use that phrase, spiritual siblings sharing sacred space. Each year, I tend to preach once at BJC and the rabbi preaches and leads worship in our congregation. We have annual joint Bible studies. Last year, we led a joint mission trip, an education and mission trip to Cuba, the two congregations together. We had planned a joint Holy Land trip for November of 2020 until COVID put it on hold. Now, it is not without all the differences and challenges that siblings tend to have living under the same roof. We have to figure out the nuts and bolts of who has the library, for example, for a meeting at 6.30 every Wednesday. There are issues of space usage and who has which room during which times and priority on which days, just like a brothers or sisters would if they shared space in a house. But it is worth it to develop a deep relationship that helps one understand the diversity of the sacred and go deeper in one's own tradition. We have an interfaith service every November between the two congregations that has been going on for years where both congregations worship together. After 9-11, we began expanding our witness and connection to the Muslim world, we began adding a Muslim presence at that November worship service. Some of those services have been picked up by Radio Free America, have been broadcast on a variety of media stations. In 2015, the Huffington Post named our interfaith service one of the moments, uh, the 15 moments of the year before that gave them hope for the new year, one of the 15 great religious moments in the whole world that gave them hope for the year to come to see the three face worshiping together. We've had a number of interfaith services after significant moments over the last several years in American history and politics. And so our community set a strategic goal of adding a permanent Muslim congregation to our space in our 2016 strategic plan. And so after three years of talking to a variety of Muslim congregations, coming close several times, but not having it quite work out for several reasons, and trying out renting space for Ramadan and Eid, two great festivals and religious times in the Muslim holiday, in the Muslim year. In 2019, Makam e Ibrahim Islamic Center, MIIC, joined as a permanent partner at 6601 Bradley Boulevard. 
So now every week we have three Abrahamic faiths, all three faiths, Muslims, Christians, and Jews, who have their worship services under the same roof each week. It was on hold for a while with COVID, but now as I speak, all three congregations are now back uh, worshiping in person. We do a number of mission projects together. One of the great things is being able to pull the resources to be more effective in mission. So significant fundraising and work with Habitat for Humanity, for example. We sponsored several refugee families from the Middle East. We're currently doing some projects together around gun violence, around helping support uh, force, dealing with forced labor in China and a number of things around climate change and environmental justice. As there are an increasing number of interfaith couples in our world, the experience of learning and having people just down the hall of other faiths gives me strength and support as I work with interfaith couples in my own congregation who are part of that and in our community. And we've had a number of communities now come to 6601 to learn about us. We've had communities from Baltimore, from as far away as Kazakhstan, from Cuba, from Germany, folks at the National Cathedral have hosted us, who've reached out to ask, well, how do we do this, live, this interfaith work of sharing space, the three congregations under one roof? And we were so honored that on June 6th, the Interfaith Council of Metropolitan Washington uh, honored our three congregations with Bridge Builder of the Year Award at a ceremony on June 6th. So each week here, the, you know, the ethnography of what goes on at 6601 Bradley is that Sunday morning worship occurs as it would in any Presbyterian congregation. Friday evening, BJC has its Shabbat service with lots of, of music as well as Saturday morning services and Sunday school. We have an early afternoon service in that same covenant hall space with prayer mats and a prayer leader of MIIC as a Muslim community gathers for Juma prayer. During the high holidays in which BJC works and uses our main space, the sanctuary, there's a big covering that covers our cross. And so they have the Hebrew of the Ten Commandments that covers the cross that transforms the space into a Jewish worship space. Number of bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs still, still take place. And in some of our larger spaces where we've served food, we've had Ramadan and Eid services. It's been amazing to see in which our, how our communities have come together and have worked in this way to form a joint place. And the nuts and bolts of this only work if there are trust among the people who are in those communities. I found great friendships and trust in dealing with the other clergy and the other leaders of those congregations. We have a weekly meeting, a weekly staff meeting in which members of the interfaith community gather. And then at a, at a non-clergy, a non-staff level, we have a lay connection group that every other month, lay leaders from BJC and Bradley Hills meet to talk about intercongregational partnership activities. And then there are three faith lay groups, such as we have a Abrahamic faith hiking group in which Muslims, Christians, and Jews will sometimes go hiking together. Now, not everyone is, was in favor of these joint arrangements. There are risks. Not everyone in any congregation will support such an arrangement. Not everyone in the pews is as interested in pluralism or interfaith as many of others of us are. And it can create space conflicts. Sharing your space with somebody else means that some of those rooms are not as available as they once were. If one partner has a financial issue, we're hitching our wagons together if we joint fundraise together on projects. We've had some folks who have looked at other congregations. We haven't lost many people as a result of these arrangements, but we have lost some for whom interfaith dialogue and such pluralism is not for them. On the other hand, we've gained many more people as a result of this arrangement than we have lost. There are many folks who's, for whom their first exposure to our Presbyterian congregation was the interfaith service and who think that it is a very unique thing to see all three Abrahamic faiths under one roof. And if they are in an interfaith couple or interfaith relationship, or they're looking for a congregation that seeks to live out the diversity of the sacred in, in creative and new ways, this has been wonderful evangelism for us in connecting people to our community. 
But as one is dealing with some of these relationships, I found pastorally the need for me to have a long-term view of listening and following people on their journeys. We've had members of our community who have converted to one of the other religions from being a member of our community. We had one person who was a member of our community, joined one of the other two communities, and then came back and joined our community again, became a Christian once again, and became a Presbyterian Christian again. I don't think that would have happened had I condemned the person for having a stirring of the spirit to convert in the first place to one of the other religions. But by staying in relationship with the person and supporting them on wherever their journey was currently taking them, they felt supported and honored in following the spirit then to return as a Christian to currently be part of our congregation. We've had young people who've gone off in mission service abroad and have converted to one of the other religions. But being a place where they could still find a way to stay in relationship with their family, who's a member of our community, while worshiping at one of the other religious traditions within our same space has been something that those families have appreciated. So as I think about the pastoral implications of living pluralism, there are amazing stories that are told in some ways, similar experiences in different ways by different faith traditions. And as a pastor, being sensitive to how people have experienced God, experiencing the rituals of life, of marriage, of birth, of death in different ways, has done wonderful work in supporting my own ministry in those areas. It makes me more creative to think about end of life or marriage, to be able to bring in other traditions and rituals that I might not have first considered. It is joyful work that I found, hard work, but joyful work to be together pastorally with other great leaders of different faith traditions who have been counselors to me personally. The evangelism I mentioned has been very, very strong. But to deepen my own pastoral roots in Christianity emerging from Judaism, it's wonderful to be able to walk down the hall and to have a Jewish rabbi who, if I say, will you perhaps host a Seder for us to learn about the roots of Maundy Thursday in the Christian tradition coming out of Passover, a Passover Seder, and for us to think about communion, and then for, them, for him to host a Seder as they've done several times, and us to be able to think about our own tradition in the context of the Jewish Seder has been deep and meaningful work. And to see that I really have now a larger flock of people I love and have been in mission and in ministry with through these different congregations allows me to think in ways that I would not be able to by giving such a breadth of experience of how others have pastorally walked similar journeys in other faith traditions. Personally, having other clergy in the building but who are not exactly part of my own community is a support system. The ability to be able to turn to someone and to share a scenario or a personal challenge has been very meaningful and very helpful. I have sat on Fridays during the Juma prayer time at which Muslims have gathered, and I've gathered for Shabbat service and prayed with my Jewish sisters and brothers. And both are deeply meaningful experiences spiritually. They're not unlike experiences that I lead my congregation in, particularly during Advent and Lent in the Christian tradition. But as I sit and pray as a Christian, not as a Muslim or as a Jew, but as a welcome Christian in their space, I do find that staying true to my own roots, the centrality of Christ, my own relationship as a Christian with God, but in community with others who are seeking to find the sacred as well, allows me to experience their religious traditions in a way that is both respectful, but also personally very holy. This is a time in which our world is searching for social justice. There is a prophetic nature and witness to this kind of living pluralism. The idea of sharing sacred space with people of a different tradition is incredible missional work. When we think about living out social, social righteousness in the world, a world that is far too violent and one where violence caused by religion, 
whether we think about what happened on 9-11 or today between Palestinians and Jews in the Middle East or, or other areas of violence in our world based on tradition, heritage and disagreements. That being able to model what it's like prophetically for people to have goodwill and share space of people who have historically had conflict. The conflicts between Christians, Muslims, and Jews over the centuries has been one of the things that some people have commented that if the world is going to survive, we have to find a way for those people of those religions to fundamentally get along. And there have been times in our history, even our recent history, where those have been a question. Modeling a place where the three of us are creating a holy space and a community together models prophetically what it's like, not just to seek to tolerate one another, but to deeply understand and love each other. Furthermore, when we think about social justice in our space, we're able to pull resources to do some really strong work that one congregation can't necessarily do as well as three congregations pulling its people and resources together. We are a congregation deeply committed to racial justice. And many congregations have talked about that this past year. As we have brought a community, not just of Christians, Jews, but Muslims, who are of different ethnicities and different colors, here we have people who are fundamentally majority of different races gathering under the same roof. It has deepened my own journey as I think about racial justice to sit and worship with and be in discussion with communities that are not majority Caucasian. In our case, we have a Muslim congregation, majority South Asian. When we think about the work that we've talked about in racial justice this past year, many of us have looked to Brian Stevenson, his incredible work, Just Mercy, both the film and the book. And Stevenson talks about the importance of getting close, of not keeping people at arm's length, but to understand you have to get close is what he says. We are seeking to get close to people who have a very different life experience than we do when we have three congregations under the same roof. And it allows us to think more creatively, more deeply, and I believe more justly about some of the inequalities of the world and seek to rebuild the social fabric in doing our part to try to address them. And finally, there are practical implications I've already talked about the challenge that adding people and communities under one roof has. You have to be able to compromise and work out differences and find ways to coexist in the same space. And that requires learning to work together. But in our increasingly divided and, and busy world, that seems incumbent on each of us. But we also live in a world in which many communities, many Presbyterian reform communities are finding their memberships falling and financially, they're struggling to try to afford their buildings. How do they keep the upkeep of their buildings? That's why some communities are giving up their buildings altogether and trying to, to find other creative ways to worship. We have found that having three congregations in one space leads to this increased sustainability of our community. We're able to pull resources, have rental income, find practical ways to afford the upkeep of 6601 by sharing the space with others who financially contribute to the well being of the building. It is a financial gain, a sustainability, and a win win for all three congregations. I show on my screen here the covenant between our communities. Here's a link to a magazine article that Bethesda Magazine wrote about our communities. Three different covenants on our wall, our gathering space, where all three communities gather at different times, that are sacred covenants between our communities, signed by members of our congregations. A picture of Covenant Hall. This is one space here, this room, where all three congregations, with prayer mats doing Juma prayer, with the Torah being brought from behind that sacred light on the wall you see. On, on during Shabbat and where I hold our Christian service on Sunday morning at 8.30 in Covenant Hall. There's our window again. Here's the Bridge Builder Award that we received on June 6th for the three communities. A picture of 
an imam, myself, and a rabbi with our choir in the background at our, inter our interface service. A reminder that there are pastorally, personally, prophetically, and practically some real advantages to trying to live pluralism. And the picture again of myself and Rabbi Sonny. So how do you start? How do you get into the work of living pluralism? I'd first say, get to know one's neighbors. Who's just around the corner? What communities are close to your congregation? Who have you done other projects with that you might see eye to eye on philosophically about the importance of the value of living out diversity and being in relationship? Start with a Bible study together or a, a study of, of sacred texts and traditions. Look at the, the Quran or you look at the Torah, look at the New Testament, see where there are similarities and differences. There are more similarities than one might realize in the Abrahamic texts and some of their traditions where prophets are honored or other traditions that might be near you beyond those three. Get to know each other at first and see where the spirit leads. You can't put something together in the same place from nothing, and you have to start somewhere. You are most welcome to visit us at 6601 or at bradleyhillschurch.org or get my contact info through the Reformed Institute. I'd love to talk to you about our experience or any tips we have learned or challenges that we faced as you do this work of living pluralism. I will close here with a picture in our gathering space, which is again adjacent to our Covenant Hall. A picture here that has both Muslims and Christians and Jews who gather at different times, not giving up their own tradition or their own heritage, but deepening their own traditions and heritage by learning from others, by living out their calling to be peacemakers that is important in all three traditions. To realize that at 6601, if you were to fly from BWI over our roof and look down, you'd see our sanctuary, which from the sky is in the picture or the shape of a cross, our covenant hall, which actually from the sky is the Star of David. And if one were to look from the sky from our music wing all the way through to our education side to what we call Memorial Hall, it's really in the shape of a crescent. And so as God looks from the sky down and sees the three symbols of the Abrahamic face, I believe that God smiles on what we've created at 6601. As a reformed Christian, I'm proud to be part of a community that is proud of its reformed heritage. And for me, I found that I feel even more strongly about my reformed heritage and the ways in which it finds intersections with others in this diverse world that we live in, as I seek to do my best in living pluralism. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you have a blessed rest of your day and week. God bless.